Welcome to the Weekly Squeak, your weekly geeky squeak with me, Christian Chiller. We're going to do something a little different this episode. Uh, the past week or so has been a very interesting week for many people around the world, uh, especially in the US. Um, certain issues in the US have raised their head yet again. I don't feel particularly qualified to really talk about them. Um, it also seemed inappropriate to start talking about random tech news in this week. So what I'm going to do is the only link I'm going to have this show is one I highly recommend from a couple of days ago. One of the podcasts I like to listen to on a daily basis, the Daily Tech News Show. They had a very good episode called Time to Listen with uh, stories from people who experience racism and um, discrimination on a very regular basis and listening to their stories. So I'm going to recommend you have a listen to that episode and that is the only thing I'm going to link to this episode. So please do have a listen to that after you finish listening to this show. That said, I do still have an interview for you. Um, again, I'm going to kind of work into some current news and some current uh, problems in the world and I'm going to recant back to COVID-19. And this is an interview I did with Alexander Wong of the University of Waterloo up in Canada and Darwin AI uh, about a uh, AI slash machine learning platform they created very, very quickly to help data scientists uh, better use data to help cope with um, scanning uh, lungs for potential effects of COVID-19. So image recognition and, uh, la and processing large data sets in a very effective way and very focused way. So here is my interview with Alexander. Perfect. So uh, I'm uh, Alex Wong. Uh, I'm a research chair uh, in the uh, field of uh, artificial intelligence. I'm also a chief scientist for uh, Darwin AI, which is a company that I've uh, co-founded, uh, where the company focuses on creating a, a, a deep learning development platform a cater to accelerating deep learning development through the use of AI itself. Okay. And uh, let's, let's start with maybe the most time relevant one, which was uh, COVID-Net. 
And I try to keep most of my stuff free of COVID news right now, but it's getting harder because there's <laughs> not much else sometimes. Um, what, what is COVIDnet and what problem were you trying to help out with there? So uh, COVIDnet is a, a global uh, open source, open access initiative that, my, that I've launched uh, through, uh, I guess, uh, my research group at the University of Waterloo, as well as through my uh, research team at uh, Darwin AI, where the goal is to accelerate the development of deep learning uh, approaches for uh, tackling up problems that are important for COVID-19, uh, with the main focuses having been on uh, COVID-19 detection, as well as COVID-19 risk stratification uh, using chest radiography. Okay. And how, who, who, who is likely to use it and how do they use it? So the, the good thing is that the, we made it completely open source, open access, so anyone can build upon it. The hope is that uh, both, uh, I guess, research scientists, uh, you know, engineers, uh, you know, citizen data scientists would be able to leverage it to accelerate progress in this area. And with the end goal that uh, the uh, types of deep learning uh, assisted uh, diagnostics, as well as uh, you know, risk stratification tools become uh, uh, gets to the point where it's clinically viable, so that uh, clinicians, uh, you know, frontline workers, and so on and so forth, are able to then leverage it to help with their particular task. Uh, mainly, because right now there's a very heavy dependence on. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, a lot of the viral mm-hmm. testing, so uh, RT PCR, so on and so forth. Uh, one of the key things is that that's great, uh, but uh, with RTC, uh, there's a time lag, so it takes time for the okay. results to come through. Right now, it could be a day, even as the longest I've heard has been uh, all mm. seven days. And so that's quite a bit of a long time. So when you help the patient uh, in the meantime, well, the results are coming yeah. back. Yeah. Uh, the other one is, as you know, uh, that there is a, uh, there's still a worldwide yeah. shortage of testing going on uh, and the last thing is that even even if somebody tests positive for COVID-19 uh, you, you still you still need to have additional uh, examinations to figure out exactly severity you know uh, what kind of treatments the patient needs so our goal here by leveraging uh, chest radiography examinations which are which are commonly done uh, alongside uh viral testing. Uh, this uh, adds as an additional complementary mm-hmm. technology uh, along with uh, AI to help uh, doctors make better decisions uh, while they're waiting for testing results to come back, as well as to have a much better understanding of severity and treatment planning going forward. And for those, I mean, for I've interviewed a couple of open source um, healthcare related projects. And one of the problems a lot of them have come up against is the tools they build are great, but then getting doctors to use them is maybe the bigger challenge. So how how would the medical profession end up using this for those chest x-rays? Or is this kind of like an ideal world? You've built it so they can kind of thing. Or is it mostly something that a, a hospital might send off to someone else, a data scientist, to do? Like where in the process does COVID net step in and how do people use it to... To help yes so uh, the very good question so we're tackling that from a number of different fronts one is that we're working with uh, different clinicians uh, from around the world to get their feedback and also try to get informed that uh, they are able to use more readily uh, the other key thing is that by also making an open source open access, we're also working with them to uh, investigate how it might integrate into their particular clinical workflow, uh, because with uh, which is perfect great in terms of privacy and so on. So we have great respect for all of that. One of the key things that by making it open source is that clinician and uh, other clinical scientists also have access to all of it, in which case they could actually do things on their on premise uh, on their own end to try to figure out how things could fit in. So we're essentially trying to facilitate both by working with clinicians as well as giving them access so that they could actually find good ways to incorporate into their clinical workflow. Okay. And is and the project is obviously very new, but is are any um 
hospitals or doctors or scanning facilities using this yet at all to help? Uh, yeah, so they're investigating okay. uh, within their systems and looking into how that works. Okay. Um, I know University of Waterloo has a pretty good um, history when it comes to some of this stuff, so, <laughs> so hopefully. We're, we're all about like, getting things to work. And um, I guess you've sort of already answered what prompted you to build it. Um, how did you build it? What did you base the, the logic, the, the models on? Um, did you have some previous experience in the space that, that helped influence that? Or did you speak to some, some people that helped influence that? Yeah, how, how did you build it and, and why did you build it the way you built it? Okay, so I can answer that in a lot of detail. So I, I've had uh, pretty much close to two, two decades of experience in the deep learning realm uh, going way back. Uh, and so I, I've had a really good experience uh, with uh, developing uh, you know, deep neural networks for different tasks. Uh, one of the key things is that it, even with all that experience, it's actually uh, very tricky to build something that is uh, tailored to a particular task, in this case, uh, COVID-19 detection and risk stratification. So uh, what I leveraged was uh, to help me uh, accelerate this process is uh, the, the Darwin AI Jensen platform, which I uh, invented a lot of the technologies behind. Uh, the beauty of that, of the uh, Jensen platform, is that it allows me to provide prototypes that I've uh, drafted uh, in terms of, let's say, uh, you know, design principles uh, around what I wanted to build. Uh, but I also provided operational requirements, such as I, I needed to achieve a certain level, let's say, sensitivity, positive predictive uh, value. Uh, you know, supposedly I, I needed to run on you know, certain uh, hardware, certain size, certain memory constraints, and so on and so forth. So I can actually provide that all that information as well as my expertise in design principles for it to leverage in terms of prototype. And then what it does is that its underlying AI will then learn from all that information and then be automatically generate not one, but different uh, highly high performance, highly efficient neural networks that are fully ready to go with different trade-offs from which I could uh, draw from. And that's how I'm able to greatly accelerate what would usually take months to uh, under a week. And the other key thing also that helped me a lot is, especially in the realm of uh, healthcare, uh, transparency becomes very important. It's not just about building a model and getting high numbers, but it's about is the model actually making the right decisions based on the right reasoning. And so for that, I leveraged the uh, uh, the Jensen platform's uh, explainable AI to do uh, performance validation. And that was actually quite crucial uh, because uh, on some of the early attempts that I had, uh, it was uh, we, we ended with, up with models that uh, had really, really high uh, performance numbers, but we found that it was using the incorrect visual cues to make those decisions. And so that actually was not a problem with the model, but it was actually a problem with the way we uh, processed and uh, uh, the data. So in which case, knowing that information, we're able to mitigate, correct for it really quickly, and then right away get much better models. I'd like to come back to that uh, explainable AI part in a minute. That's actually a subject I'm quite interested in. But uh, I can see, so the repository that you have here is, uh, I suppose, a month old at most, um, you have a reasonable um, amount of community interaction. There's some questions being asked and the issues and things like that. What has the general response been from people? And I guess um, how have people tried to use it? Have they had success in, in making it useful? What, what's people's feedback? What's been the general response from the quote unquote community, because I think the community is probably lots of different sorts of people, but what has the response been so far? So, uh, the general response from the community, as you mentioned, it, it varies, but uh, the overwhelming majority has given up an overwhelming uh, positive response and has been very supportive of the projects, uh, of this project, and has been giving you know great feedback. We've had a lot of uh, collaborators, uh, lots of support uh, from you know 
different individuals with in terms of compute. So they've been very supportive of this project and people have uh, done quite some very interesting things with it. Uh, so we've seen people uh, fork up branches where they were looking into what's a great way to build a interface around it. What's a, a good way to build a, let's say a cloud uh, environment around it so that makes it easier for people to use. Uh, I've seen people uh, leverage the uh, the models and data sources and expand upon it to try to get better performance, uh, to uh, try to have it running on different, let's say, uh, operating systems, platforms. So people have been doing a wide variety of different things, including I've also seen uh, some people who actually try to incorporate into uh, PAC systems, which is what a, do a doctor usually uses. And so it's actually very gratifying for me to see that it's actually spawned a very positive uh, response with the community. But not only that, that they are actually actively participating to see how it could be leveraged uh, within uh, for to, to essentially help with the pandemic. So it's been uh, very, uh, I guess, I I'm very happy about it. Let's uh, move on to Darwin AI. And despite the fact that I think you are still, partially at least, at university, you have a, a company here that has some uh, quite large company names on the homepage. Um, we can dig into quite what you're doing with those companies maybe. But um, what is Darwin AI? You have the, the slogan on the front page of building AI you can trust and this concept you've already mentioned of explainable AI, which uh, is something I'm a, a fan of, of trying to explain to people why a model and why an artificial in intelligence is giving the, res the results it is and, and what's behind the scenes and things like that in an understandable, explainable way. Um, why did you start this company and, and what is your intention with it? So the reason I started this company is that uh, having, like, like I mentioned, having been in this area for so long, uh, I've, I've just seen so many of the pain points uh, experienced both by myself in academia as well as uh, experienced by uh, industry at large, just from my conversations and collaborations. And the same pain points always come up when they're trying to develop something for mm -hmm. deep learning. So uh, early on in the uh, deep learning uh, uh, development, uh, quite a bit a while ago, people, uh, in, uh, in industry has been was uh, pretty much uh, still looking at companies were looking at okay great we'll build a team and we'll focus on just uh, let's say accuracy targets, right? So I, I need to have a model for this particular task that hits a certain accuracy, and then what ends up happening is to get there is a very excruciating uh, trial and error process uh, that involves teams to keep you know iterating keep tuning uh essentially there's a lot of guess work involved uh, and so now suppose after months they're able to get something that hits certain accuracy targets so that's great then uh they can't deploy it because it's too complex uh it doesn't meet the operational requirements in which case now I need to deploy on this hardware. It needs to run this fast. It needs to do all of this and still maintain accuracy. So now you have a situation where months of work now requires another year or so of people trying to hand tune it to get it into a form that works if they could do that at all. So now the mentality has kind of shifted. It's like, okay, great. People are like, now companies are thinking, okay, now I actually have to build things that not only meet accuracy requirements, but also operational requirements. Not only should they be good, they should be deployable. And not only that, they should be making the right decisions. And so now you have this very complicated process that involves many steps of architecture tuning, uh, let's say retraining, training tuning based on the architecture, and then also figuring out whether or not the performance, hold, whether it's actually doing the right thing. And so now we're talking about this very, very, uh, very long and arduous and time-consuming process. So seeing that pains me because, you know, how does anything get done? So what I decided to is one of my focuses has been, can we actually accelerate this deep learning development process through a lot of the research that I've been doing, which has been focused on the automatic generation of high quality, highly efficient uh, deep neural network models, as well as understanding how they behave. 
So that's the impetus that pushed me to actually start Darwin AI, where with Darwin AI, the goal is to build a deep learn, a AI assisted deep learning development platform that deals with these specific pain points. And you also mentioned, and it's on the website here as well, this uh, GenSynth. Is this a, a commercial project or is it another open source project? Is it something you, you uh, use to help clients? What exactly is that? So essentially, uh, the, the key, uh, the core flagship uh, product, a commercial product for Darwin AI is GenSynth. And that's the... Uh, AI-assisted uh, accelerated deep learning development platform uh, that helps developers go through, pretty much tackle these pain points by, uh, again, learning from the operational actually targets of the developer, the uh, prototypes created by the developer, and learning from all that to automate a process of building uh, different models with different trade-offs that meet the operational and actually uh, requirements necessary for real-world deployment. Okay, um, and so the, the the some of the companies that you have listed on the web page are they using this in uh, in trial? Are they using it for uh, production projects? Um, any particular kind of use cases they tend to be using it for? So uh, yes, uh, them as well as a lot of other people are using our uh, platform, and so some of the key, I guess, uh, I guess areas that Jensen is being leveraged for uh, include automotive, aerospace, uh, consumer electronics. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember what are some of the other use cases. It's, there's been quite a lot. Of course, here as you saw with yeah. healthcare. Uh, so we have, it, it's being used by quite a lot of diff- different verticals because it's, it's a yeah. common pain point. Okay. And how deep do you go with this explainable AI? Do you go as deep as um, trying to help uh, clients explain the data set and the repercussions of AI models to their clients or is it more explaining it to your clients? That's, that's a very good question. It's actually a combination of uh, the things that you've mentioned. So a couple of things that gets, gets explained is one is the goal with uh, the Jensen platform is to enable transparency at different stages of uh, development. So one is having great transparency into, you know, what are some of the key bottlenecks or performance bottlenecks or efficient bottlenecks of the networks that are being created? So that's one. The other one is to explain the critical factors that led to decisions in a quantitative way so that people have a clear understanding that based on data, this is how uh, the developed uh, deep learning model is behaving both in a correct or incorrect way. So you're able to identify biases, you're able to identify errors and so on and so forth. So I'll I'll just talk about two quick uh, use cases Mm -hmm. just for context. So uh, one example is I was just talking about uh, on the COVID net side. So uh, one, there was a model that we scrapped because, uh, and it was actually not a model problem, but a data related problem, which we're able to identify quickly because of explainability, was that the model was uh, identifying uh, cases by reading text. So uh, I'm not sure you're familiar with uh, chest x-rays or radiography. Not really, thankfully. A lot of times there's... (laughs) Yes. (laughs) But what what ends happening is that instead of just having an image of a person, there's also, uh, in terms of their anatomy, there's a lot of times there's metadata that's embedded directly Mm -hmm. into the images. So for example, letters, symbols, and so on and so forth. And so for that particular model, what it ended up doing was it ended up using the wrong cues to make the right decisions. So essentially making the right decisions for all the wrong reasons. And that was because it was looking at text. And so therefore, once we have this understanding, we knew that it was a data problem. So essentially garbage in, garbage out. We fixed the data so that text is not prevalent, uh, in which case it It never relied on text to make decisions after. So it's now making the right decisions based on the right Mm. cues. 
So that's one example. Uh, another example is for the automotive case, uh, use case, where we were able to help identify not just model error, this, which is where model made a mistake, but why it made a particular mistake. So it mistaken, let's say one uh, one example is, so uh, one, one example was a situation where it was identifying a, a mm. pedestrian as a cyclist. Mm. And then with uh, this, it was able to identify the critical uh, factor being the bike that was parked directly near that person that the person is actually partially occluding, which it, which led it to think that it was a cyclist. So it was a logical mistake, but a mistake nevertheless that needed to be corrected. But we also, use, uh, using Jensen, we were able to identify other problems. So for example, uh, it was able to identify a bunch of people that the model was correctly identifying as pedestrians, but none of them were actually annotated by the person because the human annotator had, I guess, in that case, been a little sloppy and uh, forgotten to annotate those individuals. So now this becomes a data problem. So these are all the kind of uh, things that we could help identify so that it makes it much easier to mitigate and correct and build much more reliable models that you can trust in a much faster time frame. Okay. Um, I would love, uh, I think it's one of the, 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 I think because you're a new company, it would be, it'd be fascinating to actually like see more of what's going on, but because um, at the moment you have a lot of quite interesting sounding things, but I sort of have to take it on on your word of how it works. <laughs> but that's fair enough. You know, building kind of a, a platform that anyone can just uh, come along and, and try and experiment with is is a difficult process. So, so, so quick question. So, uh, do you uh, can you actually are you on on computer while doing that, or are you on, on your computer, phone? Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, let me share the screen really quickly. I think it, it will uh, resonate a lot more. Okay, perfect. So just to run you through uh, the developer experience. So uh, pretty much that's what uh, the Jensen platform looks like. So right now it could it could sit on your cloud, it could sit on-prem, however you want to set up uh, with a lot of uh, different, uh, I guess, uh, industrial partners that we have. Uh, privacy is a very important issue. So everything just gets deployed on-prem for them. So here as a developer, suppose I prototype, let's say I created, you know, the rough scaffolding of a prototype for a, uh, let's say, neural network for my particular task I like to solve. I haven't trained it. I haven't done anything else with it. I just put together the scaffolding as well as links to the data. What you do is that you then go into Jensen and you start a new job. You enter all that information. Right in terms of here's my model setup, uh, here's the uh, operational targets I need, uh, here are all the uh, accuracy R targets I need, and here is the you know computing resources I, I would like it to run on. And so once you put in all that information, what it does is that as I mentioned, it will actually learn from the information and it'll start automatically generating uh, neural networks with different trade-offs that meet your particular requirements. So if you take a look at this particular screen, this is one particular job that was started based on the scaffolding, uh, as well as the information uh, regarding operational targets, accuracy targets, and so on and so forth. And what it does is here, it actually generates uh, six, in this case, six different models with different trade-offs, all meeting requirements. So you take a look, for example, uh, you know, uh, cycle one, which is the one of the models that generated, it actually, you know, is a very small model. That's uh, half the size of another model that get generated, but it actually got higher performance as well as a very low flops count. And even if you take a look at the uh, the fifth, uh, you know, cycle five model that gets generated, it is pretty much more than order of magnitude smaller than one of the uh, earlier models and also significantly faster, but still providing strong performance that meet accuracy requirements. So that's what this, and I'm not doing this. Once it gets started, it gets automatically done. I'm just here to analyze. And any one of these can then be downloaded straight from the platform, ready to go. So it's not just suggesting uh, design to you. It actually provides a ready to go model that you could deploy it right okay. off the bat. All right. Okay, cool. Okay. I think I get it now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then afterwards, we brought all the, like, like I mentioned, transparency at every stage. Here's a full analysis of every model that gets generated, all the different components, its uh, computational cost, uh, its size, memory footprint, and so on and so forth. And the underlying uh, Genesis AI also identifies, if you look in pink, it also highlights all the performance bottlenecks. So you know where it's doing well, what are some of the things that's holding it back. So again, all the information that you need, uh, all in the control as, as a developer. Uh, you're able to visualize all the efficiencies and inefficiencies of that things that get produced in a graphical manner. You're able to compare different models that get generated and look at their different uh, performance, speed, efficiency trade-offs. And then, so th that's all automated. And then what you can do is, like we talk about the whole notion of uh, trust and responsible development. So once these models are created, you can actually take a look at them because Jensen will take it and they'll decompose it to its different error scenarios so that you're able to see, you know, is a pedestrian being uh, confused as a cyclist or a car being confused as a pedestrian uh, because you could have actually many different types of error scenarios within the same image, right? Because, you know, you might have, let's say, the car taking a, uh, the camera will see, you know, there's three cars, two people, and cyclists. So it's able to decompose all that. So you have a full understanding with the error scenarios. And you could actually drill into any one of those to look at those individual scenarios. So these are all the cases where it's actually a pedestrian, but it's been mistaken as a cyclist. And if I were to click on any one of these, then I can actually analyze that situation. So this is an interesting situation where the uh, the model that got built, that it so using this, it was able to identify this error scenario where the uh, model thinks it's a cyclist, and but the human annotator had said it was a pedestrian. Well, it is really a cyclist who just got off her bike to walk her bike. So that becomes a scenario that becomes a bit ambiguous that needs to be dealt with. And not only that, within the same scene, you could actually not only identify and look at one particular error scenario, but you can look at all the different error scenarios available. So, for example, another scenario is this is just a person that got missed. So that is clearly a model error that needs to be accounted for. But here's a situation that I mentioned to you before, where these are all of the pedestrians that the model has identified, but was not annotated by the humans. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you send it back to the human annotator and say, you know, you didn't do a great job. Please mm -hmm. re-annotate this. And this becomes important because data is one of the lifeblood of deep learning and garbage in, gar garbage out. All right. That was actually really helpful. Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. Just, uh, just really quickly, here's that example I told you about where oh, yeah. here's a uh, pedestrian uh, who got mistaken as a cyclist because of the mm -hmm. bike over there. And just one last case to show you is uh, it also helps identify the critical factors it makes uses to make a decision. So in this case here, the situation where it, the model believes it is a iPod and it is a pod, iPod, but the reason it thinks it's an iPod is not because of the background, there's nothing in the back, but the iconic mm -hmm. dial on the iPod. And so that is what makes leads to a decision. And on the right, you'll see the prediction confidence. It will say that when it's actually focusing on this critical factor, the iconic dial, it's very confident yeah. as an iPod. But if you get rid of that, it actually thinks it's a printer. I've never seen a and printer that looks even like even yourself. This, you yeah. cover. If you, <laughs> I mean, uh, one one of the key things that we also identify was uh, by looking at data of uh, images of printers. What it's actually, if you actually ignore the yeah. iconic dial, you know the, the old iPod screens that actually some of those screens exist okay. in laser printers. Yeah. Fair enough. So, so that's that's kind of at least at least you have some sense as to why it's yeah. making a good decision or yeah. why it might make a wrong decision. Okay. Cool. All right. Just the final. Yeah. Just wanted no, to that's give you actually a quick really, that's show, actually yeah. really that's useful. All. That's really useful. The last question, just to wrap up with, because I always like to ask, is for Darwin AI yep. and for COVIDnet, what's next on the roadmap? What are you planning next for either one of those or both of those? Sure. So uh, I'll, I'll go with COVIDnet first and I'll talk about Darwin. So uh, COVIDnet, one of the key things is a uh, closer collaboration. We're continually working with uh, clinicians. We're continuously getting more and more data. The main goal now is to try to get it in a form that becomes a, 
a lot more yep. viable from a clinical perspective. So uh, outside of uh, detection, we're also focusing on severity mm-hmm. prediction and so on and so forth. So that's on the COVID net side. So we're continuing mm-hmm. pushing forward with that. Uh, with the Darwin AI side, one of the key things that we're really uh, trying to emphasize on the platform is to really continue to uh, improve the underlying mm-hmm. technology and the platform itself so that uh, it's able to continue to uh, improve and accelerate the speed with which developers can reach their mm-hmm. goals faster. So uh, with that in mind, one is, you know, how do we improve the underlying AI of uh, the platform to gain even better performance or to meet uh, operational uh, accuracy requirements even faster to account for the different kinds of use cases that's out there in industry and make sure that we provide a state-of-the-art mm-hmm. support for them. Excellent. And of course, the last thing is to really continue to uh, push uh, in terms of making a push on the, uh, I guess, uh, transparency side so that people have a much better idea to make sure that helping developers make sure that their models are, in fact, doing what it's supposed to do. That was my interview with Alexander Wong of Darwin AI, University of Waterloo, talking about their COVIDnet project. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, yes, it has been quite a week. I, I've also been busy in my own world. Um, I don't have too much to update you about. Uh, there have been some more episodes of my uh, DX Teardown, which you can find on YouTube. There have been more episodes of my solo gaming stream you can find on Twitch. You can find all the links to these on christianchiller.com. I've got a few new articles in progress. I finished up some documentation work and a few more things bubbling under the surface. I think, uh, We just recorded the second episode of the Board Game Jerk podcast. We are now about to record the kind of um, in-between bits of the storytelling podcast. So there will be two episodes of that very soon as well. Um, And I'm about to do a little bit of an overhaul on the website as well with a few things. And the Chip Shop game is also in progress. We're having a good working beat on Saturday coming up. So plenty more to come from that too. So I'm going to leave it there for this week. Keep the show fairly focused. And I would like to say that uh, anybody out there, please look after yourselves, stay healthy, stay safe. Um, And I hope you all live the best lives you can. And until next time, if you have been, thank you very much for listening.